Okay, so for our final section, I want to address a very common question that I get from students at the end of all of these classes where we cover these technical details and all of these, these cool new skills that you've learned. Um, one of the most common questions I get is this. Um, how do I keep learning this stuff? Um, I've been introduced to R. Um, what do I do next? What class should I take next? Or what book should I read next? And there are no good answers to this, or there is a good answer to it, but it's not what you're thinking. Um, especially because you can keep taking classes in this. Um, at GSU specifically, if you're looking at the Andrew Young School, there aren't a lot of classes that are focused on R. Because in general, there aren't a lot of classes. If you're doing a master's degree, um, you're taking like two or three classes a semester and you do it for two years and then you're out. You just have a handful of classes you're doing. If you're doing a PhD, you're taking two or three years of coursework and then you're done. Um, and as a PhD student, that's normally like two classes a semester, um, maybe three. And so there's not a lot of classes out there um, that are designed for just teaching you R. And so it, you can't really just like go hunt down all of the R related classes. What my recommendation is, if you want to keep learning this stuff and keep improving, um, it's not to go find the next R book and start working through that. And it's not to find some extra class to take. It is to be as curious as possible and to pursue that curiosity. Um, and this is what I've been trying to do throughout the semester. If you look at um, the structure of your assignments at the very beginning of the semester, um, you had to do the R Studio primers and you worked through very, very detailed steps. There were um, lessons on the course website that you worked through that had you basically copy and paste code, change one thing, see what happens, and so you were getting the mechanics of how ggplot worked. Then in the, the second third of the course, um, when we talked about more specific principles of data visualization, like here's how you do column charts and line charts and heat maps and things like that, um, you had more freedom to do stuff, um, but your exercises were still like, here's a real world data set, here's some code to clean it up, make something with it. Um, and so you, were, you still had specific guidelines you were working with. But then if you've, if you've noticed with the final exercises for the last sessions here, um, they've essentially been find a data set, show time in it. Find a whole bunch of books from Project Gutenberg, show something with it, and make a map. Um, those were the only guidelines I gave you. There are no answer keys for those um, because there are no right answers. You were just supposed to figure out something and um, pursue whatever you wanted. Um, and I did that on purpose to help you um, kind of harness your curiosity to push you to do fun and exciting things. You could do the bare minimum. Um, and some of you, given the pandemic situation and just given time constraints, um, that's totally fine to do. But others of you um, purposely like figured out how to animate maps and how to make really, really detailed heat maps and do all sorts of really cool things. Um, and that's exciting because I didn't make you do that. Um, that was just your natural curiosity kicking in, which is then how you um, continue to learn. Um, so if you want to keep doing this stuff and become better um, at data visualization, at R in general, at storytelling, at any of this stuff, just be curious and keep doing it. Um, at this point, you know enough to continue to teach yourself. And um, that is how everybody learns. Like these experts, this is an astrophysicist. She has a large following on Twitter. Um, a couple of years ago, she tweeted this out saying that expertise is not knowing everything about something. It's knowing how to search on Google for something and knowing kind of the background context enough about something that you can then find resources. Um, if you've noticed, I've tried to emphasize this when I've been answering your questions through email and through Slack. Um, most of the time when you send me a question and say, why isn't this working? I have no idea. Um, and so I just Google stuff and I have been Googling stuff about R and ggplot for years. And so I know what key phrases to look for and I know how to find stuff. Um, and that's only because I've just been working with it and that comes with experience. Um, I do not know everything about R. That is impossible to do. Um, I just am pretty efficient at searching for R stuff. And even then it can take a long time or I just give up. Um, but searching is kind of the key to doing this. Going through kind of a very outliney version of like, you must know all of these principles and you must like memorize these lines of code. Some programming classes will do that. Some computer science classes will do that. They'll just say, you must know every single bit of code. 
um, to pass this class. I purposely did not do that um, because again, in the real world, everybody Googles stuff. You don't have to keep things memorized, but also because that's not how we learn best. Um, a couple of years ago, Slate, um, which is known for its contrarian takes in different articles, published this that said, don't teach your kids to code. Um, and based on the headline, this looks like super controversial and like people were yelling about it on Twitter because they were only seeing the headline. And so people were like, yes, we need to teach our kids to code. But that was not this guy's main point. Um, if you click on the link in the presenter notes, you can read the whole article. But his conclusion here is that if you're teaching kids to code using kind of existing boot camps or kid specific programs for like, here's how you code, those generally go step by step and say, make this turtle move 10 steps to the left and then make the turtle move 10 steps up and then make it jump and like, that's how you're coding. And then when you're done, it says, congratulations, you're a coder. And that is not how we learn. Um, and so what, what he argues here is that if we force kids or you all, to learn syntax, um, then it, it teaches people that like that is the only skill you need to know. Um, and so if you just memorize everything and never look anything up, that is a very marketable skill you're an expert in R. But as I've been saying throughout the semester, that does not mean you're an expert. You can look stuff up. You need to embrace this curiosity and pursue other things instead of following just line by line recreations of things. Um, which again is why I've begin, been giving you less and less code over time because um, one, you're getting the hang of it. And two, I want you to be more curious and explore things and try things and break things and learn more things. That is the way to learn. Um, not just for kids here. He says here, only kids can learn to embrace curiosity. You can also learn to embrace curiosity. You're not kids, um, but we all need to embrace this curiosity. So with that, I'm going to give you my two secrets to master R and be and embrace this curiosity. The two secrets are find excuses to use R and share your work in public. If you can do those things, that is a way, these are both ways to harness your curiosity about the language and continue to build upon it and continue to learn and grow and make really cool and exciting things. So I'm gonna give some examples of this and what I mean by find excuses to use it and what sharing in public means. So finding excuses to use R. Um, again, you just want to play with stuff, basically. Um, one really interesting thing that you can do is if you ever just, you're reading an article and it says, we found these findings, like we saw COVID trends in this state that looked like this, you can generally go to that state and download their COVID case numbers and then you can make the same plot or you can adjust the plot or maybe you're interested in unemployment trends in one article and you wanna see if those correlate with recessions. You know how to put recession bars on time series plots. Then you go find their data and add the, the time series plots or add the recession bars. You can do all sorts of things to just kind of play with data. Um, most of you in your jobs have some data related responsibilities. You're probably working in Excel. You're probably dealing with numbers. So play with the numbers, do something exciting. Um, in some of the readings that I gave you, lots of them were just blog posts of random people who said, I found this interesting data set. And then I looked at it. Um, so in the text session, um, there was a blog post about identifying the authors of the Federalist Papers. She's not a historian of colonial America. But she was like, oh, it looks interesting. I'll dedicate an hour to doing this. And then as she said in the beginning of her blog post, it took more than an hour. She fell down this rabbit hole, but she learned a lot. Um, and that was just kind of because of natural curiosity pushing her to do that. Um, there's a more systematic way of doing this if you don't want to just track down random data. Um, on the course website, in the resources page, I have a list of different data or different sources of data. There's a newsletter that will send out weekly or I think it's a weekly publication that has just interesting data sets that this guy has found and then people play with it. Um, there's a hashtag on Twitter called Tidy Tuesday that is kind of led by Tidyverse evangelists in our studio and they pick a data set often from that one guy's um, newsletter and they say this week on Tuesday we're going to say we're going to announce this is the data set that you can all play with. And then people will play with it and visualize it in different ways and cut it up in different ways, make a model of it. They'll do just something interesting with the data and then post it on Twitter with the hashtag Tidy Tuesday and you can find stuff. And the really cool thing about this is everybody 
at all levels of, of expertise participates in this. Um, you get beginners who are doing R for the first time and they download this data set and they make a simple bar chart and they publish it and people like get really excited and congratulate them. Um, just yesterday was a Tuesday. Um, Hadley Wickham, the guy who invented ggplot, did a tidy Tuesday and he recorded him a video of himself for half an hour just downloading the data set and he had never seen it before so he live coded himself cleaning it up and plotting it and playing with it. Um, and like people were really excited because they saw like Hadley doing this and like anybody can do this. Um, so participate in it and just play around with the data. You don't even have to make it public, just you can see what other people are doing with stuff. Um, some companies um, have instituted a thing called data playtime where they allow their analysts to just play with data for half a day um, to find a data set and just tinker with it. Um, and that's not a waste of time. It's because it allows you to build new skills and create new things and explore new methods. And it's a, it's kind of fun to do. Um, and then finally, you can just use actual projects. If you have a project at work and you have to make a graph for it and you're used to doing it in Excel, force yourself to make it in R um, and make it so that you're using R in projects. That's really the way to do this. Um, if you want to learn a new skill in R, have a reason to do it. Very rarely will you just say, I want to learn multiple or uh, multi-level regression in R just so I can know how to do it. And then you're not gonna like, and then go find a multi-level regression in R book and work through the 600 pages of it. Nobody does that. What you do is you have a data set that has like multiple levels in it, like countries and years. Um, and then you say, I want to analyze this. How should I do it? And then you start teaching yourself multi-level regression so you can figure it out. And that's the process of learning. It's not just picking up a new book and running through it. It's project-based. It's trying to do something in real life with the skill that you're trying to learn. Um, so some examples of this, I actually have a folder on my computer called mini projects, um, where if I come across a weird data set or if somebody asks me for help, um, like there's this folder here called Girl Scouts. Um, one of my colleagues from uh, when I did my master's in public administration, she worked for the Girl Scouts and wanted to map um, different things for the Girl Scouts. And so that's how I figured out how to make maps. That was my first map making thing because she asked me for help in R and I was like, sure, I'll figure it out. So now, now I know how to do maps in R, but that was kind of my initial experiment with it. So I still have the scripts, they're awful. Um, but it's kind of a neat historical thing. Um, a few years ago, I think it was 2015, um, I was doing my PhD at Duke and I was on the uh, graduate student council. Every department had to choose a graduate student representative to go sit on like the, the graduate student senate, basically. And it was incredibly boring. And so I was sitting in one of the meetings and people were arguing about some parking issue or something. And I discovered while I was just thinking around on my computer that somebody had made a data set that tried to mark every instance of aggression in the Harry Potter books. And they used like natural language text processing to figure out um, all the aggressive verbs and they could figure out all the instances of aggression of who was doing what aggressive thing to who. And so I was like, that's interesting. And so during the Senate meeting, um, I made this chart in ggplot because I just wanted to play around with the data. Um, I wanted to see if I could get kind of these invisible um, lines here. So I wanted to get rid of all plot lines, or all the grid lines here, and kind of break the actual bars into grid lines because that looks artsy. Um, and then I posted this onto the internet um, on Twitter. And then somebody uh, told me to post it on Reddit because they have like this um, information or data is beautiful subreddit. So I did, I made a Reddit account never used it before and then I got like reddit gold or whatever because it means I went viral or something um, like people were really excited to see this and then more people started playing with the data because I made all the code public and so people just like did stuff with this and it took on like a whole life of its own which was cool um, people still like I still have the data on github which is a place where people can share code um, and and data and like every month or so I get random people who just like copy this exact um, code set and then they start working with it again um, it, it, it continues to live because I just kind of played with it during a, a graduate student senate meeting um, so do that just play with stuff um, or even if you're not playing with actual data just do goofy things like in six years ago in 2014 um, my family we decided to set a goal to do 100 family walks in the year 
And to make sure we stayed on track, um, we decided to, or I decided to track it with a spreadsheet. Um, and this was, it, it seemed like a really goofy thing to do. Like we made a Google, a Google form and we had our kids, um, our oldest was seven at this point. Um, we put her in charge of recording all of the family walks. And so she had to go to the Google form on a computer after we went on the walk and mark the start time and the end time. Um, and she did a good job at it, but like, and in the end, what I was able to do was collect all of the data from the Google Docs spreadsheet and plot it. And I was still learning ggplot at the point. And so this is like four different geoms on here. It has like geom rug down here showing each of the walks as like ticks. It has this, the solid line is kind of what should have been happening if we wanted to stay on track. So like one walk every 3.65 days or whatever. Um, the blue, the red line shows the actual number of walks cumulatively. And so we were like behind schedule here in the middle of the summer. So we just did a ton to get ahead, um, to show extra information. I showed when I was actually in classes cause that slowed us down significantly. Um, here on new year's Eve, we did like six walks to just like get back on track. We like came home and then right, went right back out and came home and went right back out. Um, just so we can do it. And so while this seems like goofy and super nerdy, it actually ended up being incredibly helpful because I learned one, how to make a Google form that collected data that I could then connect to using R. Um, so I figured out there are different packages that, that let you interface with Google spreadsheets. And so I found out how to use those. And so I could make this, this graph live. And so like every day I could just recreate it and see what we were like, see how on track we were. And while that's super goofy for like a family, I've been able to do it for other projects and for other research things and tracking things. Like I taught myself how to do this just for dumb reasons, but it turned out to be like a cool, marketable, useful skill. Um, and so it's, it's something you can do. Um, similarly, I had um, my seven-year-old back in 2014 write down every book she read. Um, and the same thing, I wanted to kind of do some tidy text analysis. Um, and count the number of like which authors she was reading. That was her Harry Potter year when she did it the first time, like several times. I think she went through the series three times that year because it's 21 books there. Um, but that was because I was just teaching myself how to do ggplot stuff. And so I figured I would just make up data to do it with. Um, so invent reasons to use R and just play around with it. And eventually you'll find a real reason down the road to do this kind of stuff. Um, so that's one way to embrace curiosity. But to accompany this curiosity, one thing that is very important is that you want to be able to share this and make your work public. Um, this is one of the things that the Tidy Tuesday project has been emphasizing, where when, you're, when they announce a new data set to play with, they encourage people to share the final product, but they also encourage people to share their code or to record themselves doing it or to do something um, to show the process behind making it. Because once you make that process public, then it's a lot easier for other people to learn. And it makes you a better learner too, because you're realizing mistakes that you're making, you're realizing that you're doing a good job at something. Um, and so you want to make that public. Um, and so one thing that is required for that is that you need to change the way you think about your work. Um, this. This uh, timeline here comes from a talk by David Robinson. He's one of the co-authors of the Tidy Text Mining Book. Um, if you look at the presenter notes here, he taught or he gave a lecture at an art studio conference a few years ago about um, public work and why it's important. And so his, his idea here is that normally we think of the things that we're working on with this timeline here. We have some idea and then we start writing stuff up. We have a draft manuscript, we finish the manuscript and we don't really make anything public to anybody until about here. We might show the published manuscript to, or the completed manuscript to a few colleagues. This we just keep to ourselves. This we just play with. Um, the idea we don't share with anybody. And by the time we get to publish the paper, then we announce to the world, here's our thing. Um, and what he argues is that like this is valuable down here and this is not valuable. But that's not a good way of thinking of stuff because you can actually improve on the published paper and get better science if you start sharing stuff in the middle of this process. So what he proposes to think about um, our work timelines like this. Anything on your computer is not very valuable because nobody else can see it, nobody else can give feedback for it, nobody else can build on it or improve it or um, 
compliment you on it or anything. It's just kind of private and nobody can see it. That includes like finished papers. Um, if you finish a really cool paper and it gets published in a journal and like three people see it, that's not great um, because only three people are going to see it. You worked really hard on it. You want to get that, that out into the world. So what he says is anything you keep is not going to be great. Anything you post out for just the general public, whether it be um, the final product or the code that you're working on to get to the final product or some cool idea that you're going to workshop online in a, in a forum or something, that is way more valuable because other people can do stuff with it and other people can improve on it um, and it just builds community too. Other people will have new research ideas because of your research ideas and because of seeing what you're doing. And so his argument is try to work in public as much as possible so that other people can see what you're doing and improve on stuff. Um, there are a whole bunch of benefits to doing this. One, it builds your reputation. Um, people online will see that like you're doing cool things and they'll reach out to you and ask you questions about the things you're doing. Um, and that's like great um, because if you're thinking about like marketing yourself, like that gives you all sorts of opportunities for new jobs and research and stuff. This is really good if you're if you are a PhD student working on building a network. Um, I have found multiple co-author relationships because of Twitter and because of talking to people online and just saying, hey, that's a cool idea. And then we start playing with stuff and then we write a paper together. And that's like cool. So do that, like network with people and, and find people who are doing interesting things. Um, working in public helps you learn more um, because you'll get feedback on stuff, but also because working on public, working in public encourages others to work in public and then you can learn from what they're doing. That's one of the powerful parts of this Tidy Tuesday thing. Everybody's kind of focused on one data set for that week and you can see what lots of different people are doing and new approaches to, to working with data. And the community is like great and um, thoughtful and they're positive and it's, it's really neat. Um, you can get early feedback on ideas. If you are keeping everything on your computer to yourself, you might get to the completed manuscript phase and then show it to somebody and say, look at this perfect thing. And they'll be like, Ugh, you messed up on page two and now your whole thing's destroyed and that's gonna be bad. So working in public or getting feedback early is good because then you avoid that. Um, and then finally you get validation. Um, where people will say like, good job. And that is actually a very good thing, especially if you are a, a PhD student. Most of your life is uh, centered around like rejection and um, doing things wrong and it is like really miserable. Um, and so when you get like validation of people saying like, look at this cool code this person wrote and here's how I improved it and then you improve it, like it, it feels good to do this stuff. Um, and it, it again, kind of builds your reputation and grows the community and makes everything kind of happier. Um, a good example of this is this blog post here. If you go to my personal blog or website, if you look at the presenter notes, you can get to it. Um, it took me three years of applying for jobs on the academic job market before I got this job um, at GSU. And that's because the, the academic job market pre-COVID-19 was miserable. I ended up applying for almost 200 jobs and if you look at this waffle chart here, um, every one of those jobs that rejected me or never talked to me after applying are these gray boxes. Um, the typical academic job market um, timeline is you apply for a job and then they choose like 12-ish people to Skype interview with and then they fly three people out and then they offer the job to one person. So if you look here, the yellow boxes are the Skype interviews that I had. The red boxes are flyouts. Um, and so like this first year on the market, I had one flyout and that was bad. Um, and then the second year I had like four flyouts, but no offers. Um, this last year I had one other flyout and then I did get a tenure track offer and that's here at GSU, but that was like miserable. Um, and so one way of like, I guess, coping with the miserableness of all of this is I kept track of all of the jobs I was applying to. And then once I got a job, I kind of posted out a whole bunch of visualization saying like, look how miserable this was. And like it went like semi-viral on Twitter and people were like, wow, academic job market's really bad. It's gonna get way worse like next year and now because of COVID-19. So that's awful and horrible. Um, but because I shared this as like this blog post, I also purposely also shared it as code. 
Um, so this blog post is just, it was based on an R Markdown file that I knit. This is the knitted version of it. But then I put the unknitted version of it on GitHub and shared the link to that so that people could recreate it if they wanted. So it was kind of like a pedagogical blog post. Um, so you can see like this is a chunk that looks very familiar as Tidyverse and Lubridate and the SF package and Waffle and kind of all of the stuff you've been working with throughout the semester here. And you can scroll through and see all of the code to make all of these charts. Um, but because I did this, um, once I moved to Georgia, there was a professor at UGA, at University of Georgia, in their epidemiology department that really liked the blog post because it was about R, but also because it was about like how to cope with failure in academia and how hard it is. And he wanted me to kind of give a pep talk to their PhD students about curiosity and um, sharing stuff in the open, but also like failure. So I became known as like the failure guy, which is good for my brand, I guess. Um, but it was because I did all of this work in the open and kind of shared it and people could build on it and um, I helped improve the community. That was my goal with this. So how do you actually do this? How do you work in public and build these communities like this? Um, one thing is you can use Twitter, you can create a blog. There are ways of meeting actual people. Um, that do this stuff. Um, you can play with data in public. This is the Tidy Tuesday idea. So download something that's interesting and play with it. Um, and live stream yourself if you're super brave. I've never done that, except for this class where I'm live streaming myself coding, which is really intense and terrifying. Um, but people learn, so try it, I guess. Um, teach concepts. So that was like, if you want to learn something really well, teach it and you can teach it through blog post form. So write a blog post about something interesting that you want to teach to yourself and then other people can, can learn from it too. So I'll show you some examples of this. Um, so this, this idea of communities, um, if you use Twitter, there's the hashtag rstats, that is the R community. Um, if you search for that hashtag, you'll find all sorts of R resources, people talking about new packages, new ways of doing things, troubleshooting issues, um, showing off graphs that they make, showing off results. It's kind of a, a happy, fun place. Um, there are in-person R user groups. Most major cities will have one or two R user groups that meet monthly, um, and they have somebody from the local community who does something with R demonstrate how to do something else in R and like teach people. And it's basically like a live coding example for a whole group. And it's cool because then you can meet other people doing R stuff. Um, there's also a hashtag called R Ladies. Um, the R community specifically has been trying to become more inclusive and reach out to marginalized groups. And so the whole R Ladies community um, is like R stats, but like focused on um, promoting the work of women. Um, check that out. It's fascinating stuff there. Uh, it's a great hashtag. Um, another thing you can do, and this is, there are examples of this on the uh, example page for today. You can publish your stuff on the internet in lots of different ways. Um, a couple sessions ago, I showed you how to use RPubs from within RStudio. You can knit a document and then put that on RPubs and then share that with people. That's a perfectly acceptable way to share stuff. The Tidy Tuesday stuff where people are analyzing data and sharing the code, lots of people use RPubs to do that. And that's a totally normal thing. But if you want fancier ways of sharing um, your stuff, there are ways of building entire websites with our markdown files. There's a package called Blogdown, which is actually what this course website uses, that builds an entire website um, using just R Markdown files. And so when I update this website, I find the R Markdown file for this course session, I add the YouTube link to it, or I add a chunk that creates a, a graph or something, and then I re-knit the entire website. And R, at this point, because we're at the end of the semester, it takes like five minutes to knit, because um, it goes through and knits every single R Markdown file, and then it creates a website folder, and then I upload that to my server, and then that's what you're all using. Um, and so if you want to do like super fancy blog stuff, there's ways to do that. Um, there are ways of hosting your blog for free, um, and I will have links to tutorials explaining how to do that. If you're interested in writing an entire book that is that can also be a website, there's a package called Bookdown, um, similar to Blogdown. And you've actually been using Bookdown, you just don't know it. Um, both um, Klaus Wilkie's book and Kieran Healy's book were written in Blogdown. 
Um, so if you've noticed, they both have that sidebar over on the left where you can jump around to different chapters, and then it has all the content in the main area of the page. That Both of those books are just collections of our markdown files, and they knit it, and then it creates kind of a book website. But you can also knit it as a PDF, and it'll create an entire PDF book. Um, it's possible to write an entire master's thesis or dissertation, um, PhD dissertation, using Bookdown. Um, where you have multiple chapters and everything's just kind of knitting and flowing together really nicely. So that's a cool package to check out because it, again, helps you with your writing and reproducibility, but it also helps you reach out to the community and share the stuff that you're doing. Um, playing with data in public. This is a common thing I, I've been doing over the past few years. Um, so I showed you that mini projects folder that, I've, that I had, like the Girl Scouts folder that I'd made a map and I haven't showed that to anybody because it's awful code. What I started doing four-ish years ago is instead of putting everything in that mini projects folder, I decided to, whenever I play with an interesting data set, to post it on my own website as kind of a blog post so that it is more public and more people can benefit from it and so I can teach myself how to do stuff. So this blog post, for example, um, there's a project called the Polity 4 Project that tries to score countries on how democratic they are, and they have a, a ranking from negative 10 to positive 10. And so every year they publish new rankings of, or new scores for democracy. And so in 2017, they released their, their latest data. And so I wanted to figure out how to get it directly with R instead of going to the website, hunting down the link for it, downloading it as an Excel file, opening it in Excel, cleaning it up there. I wanted to try to automate all of that. And so I figured out how, and then made a quick blog post saying like, here's how you get it directly from the internet. Here, like you have to go to Chrome, click on this thing. This is the code you need. And now you can recreate it. And so the code is there. And then like people have been using this ever since to get stuff from Polity 4. Um, during Christmas break in 2018, um, I was just decided to play with the tidy text package. Um, and so just for fun, I downloaded the entire Bible into R and the entire Quran into R and just did the tidy text stuff that we did in the last or in session 13, um, just to see what you could do with, with this stuff. And so um, I have a couple of blog posts where I just said like, here's some interesting data, let's look at it and make it look cool. And so like, here's that, um, the odds ratio or the, the different odds of seeing specific words and specific books in the Bible, or the most common nouns in Meccan surahs versus Medinan surahs in the Quran. Um, and so like, this was just a fun way of teaching myself how to do stuff and making it public. And lots of people have been using this. Um, I get comments all the time still, uh, like people stumble across this and say, wow, this was really helpful, thanks. And then other people have been, um, there are several people who have done like identical blog posts of this, but have taken other either books of scripture or other whole uh, archives from, from historical archives and done similar methods because they're again, just trying to build on what I did. I am by no means an expert in any of this, but I just did it and posted it and it helped build the community. Um, you can also teach a concept. And this is, this is super helpful for me um, personally, where if I want to remember how to do something, the easiest way to do that is to like teach other people. Um, so another reason why I've gotten really good at ggplot is because this is like um, my third or fourth time teaching this data visualization class where I've had to learn ggplot in depth enough to be able to teach you all. Um, one of the reasons I have really detailed examples for this class, the example pages have all sorts of heavily annotated code, that's in part for my benefit. So that a year from now, if I teach this class again, I don't have to reteach myself everything. I can go look at the blog posts or look at the example page and read all the comments and remember why I did what I did. Um, this example here, um, in one research project I was doing, I had to figure out the difference in means between two things. I remember I had learned that back in my early statistics class days when I was doing my master's degree, um, but I always forgot kind of the best way to do it, and I was learning new fancy Bayesian ways of doing it. And so what I decided to do was I took an afternoon and wrote a blog post saying, here's all the ways I've learned to compare differences in means, and here's an example of how to do every single one. And I just put it up on my blog and said, this is mostly just for me, so I can remember and I can refer back to here if I wanted to do a t-test or use a Bayesian simulation or use bootstrapping or use whatever, 
And now I can go back and check this. And I use this all the time, but other people use this all the time too. And like people have incorporated some of these methods into their own R packages or their own analyses um, because it exists in the community for people to use. Um, so again, do that. Um, another example is this right here. Um, another class I teach at GSU um, is microeconomics for MPA and MPP students, um, which is fun because they are not economists and they have no intention of ever becoming an official economist. I am not a formal economist. Um, my PhD is in public policy, which is like half political science, half, half economics, but I've never done economic proofs of microeconomic theories or whatever, like the scary calculus behind it. Um, and so I try to make it as simple and accessible as possible. And so I try to make graphs that are simple and accessible. Um, and so when I was teaching econ one semester, I decided I wanted to make the these typical indifference curve plots um, in R because R makes cool plots. So let's figure out how to do it in ggplot. And so this whole blog post is really just me saying, here's how I figured out how to make econ charts in R. Um, and because of that, there are a couple other R packages now that people have developed that create econ style plots. Um, I've had no control over that. I don't care. Um, they've improved it a lot. I'm going to use their packages now because it's better than what I did here. This takes a lot of code. If you look in the blog post, you'll see um, the people who have improved on this. I'm super glad they did um, because it's way more efficient. Um, but again, this is didactic for me. It was mostly teaching myself how to go through the process and I refer to it often, but then it helped the community as well. You don't have to be an expert in any of this. The whole idea of thinking in public is fantastic because anybody can do it. So if for one of your projects or one of your exercises, you have to make a map um, in your exercise, our markdown file, you'll say, I downloaded this thing. Here's the code I ran. You can actually explain what you're doing and then say, here's the plot. That is good enough for a blog post or an RPUBS knitted file that you can then send to people and say, look at this cool thing I made. Um, if you're on Twitter, you can share that and say, look at this cool thing I made and people will share it as well. And then people will learn from you and you'll learn from the conversation that ensues. So do that, share as much as you can in public, participate, be curious and um, keep pursuing this thing, th these, these ideas of, of creativity and, and visualizing data and playing with data. Um, and you'll become a lot better at this stuff and it'll be really exciting. So with that all said, you are all, after this whole semester here, expert enough to share things with R. Um, the work you've been doing is like blog level, internet level, Tidy Tuesday level stuff. Um, feel free to share that with the world and continue to learn. Be curious as much as possible um, and just play with this stuff. So my one suggestion to all of you is to just go and make cool things. Go make beautiful things. You know the, the core principles of graphic design? Play with them. You know how to make cool plots? Do it. Um, you stumble across some cool data set at work? Do something with it. You can create beautiful things. And you can tell truthful stories and you can um, make the world a, a better place through um, this data visualization stuff. So thanks everybody for a fantastic semester and good luck with your final projects and good luck making beautiful things in the future.